At the same time as tanks and motorized troops through the fields of ripe wheat rushing south and forcing the Kuban, in the area west of Kalash divisions are pulling together. They occupy the initial positions for the beginning of a major offensive. The command of the 6th Army expects to take Stalingrad in one fell swoop without a long battle. Easy to say, harder to do. After all, endlessly stretched in the waterless steppe flanks absorb a huge mass of troops and equipment. For the object of the main blow, for the mastery of the key position, the city on the Volga is too few forces. In addition, a lot of time is lost. Lack of fuel forced us in early summer a few weeks to trample in place. This respite to the enemy, undoubtedly, was enough to create defensive positions and pull up troops from the rear. However, Paulus does everything to ensure quick success. At the expense of weakening the flanks, he throws to the west bank of the Don several more divisions. The line of our defence all the way to Voronezh is so thin and stretched that it is almost certain to break. In the area of Serafimovich, on the left wing of the 6th Army, stretched widely our 79th Infantry Division. But alone its regiments and battalions to organise the defence it is not able to. Therefore, to compact the front created various battle groups. On the divisional map of the situation appears bold blue line. It goes from east to west. This is the dividing line, and under it, the names of the units. Among them you can read, Combat group filling the gap. So the defence is fortified. The position seems as stable as when watching the weekly newsreel or reading official reports from the fronts. The impression of the superiority of the German army is reinforced by the daily reports of the Wehrmacht High Command, July 30, 1942. OKW reports. German, Romanian and Slovakian troops forced the lower course of the Don on the front of 250 kilometres and defeated the defending enemy troops in this area. Motorised units and advanced detachments of infantry and mining infantry divisions are pursuing the enemy retreating in complete disorder and by parallel pursuit have already blocked his way to retreat in various places. The number of prisoners and trophies is constantly increasing but with such a rapid advance is not yet accountable, said clearly and understandably. These words inspire confidence. Local weakness in the middle reaches of the Don begins to seem like a strategic plan, a chess move of a skillful player who decided to declare the opponent checkmate in another place and other stronger pieces. After all, it is enough to open a geographical atlas and look at the map of Europe, to realise that the German battalions cannot be equally strong at all latitudes and meridians. This is prevented by the huge length of the Eastern Front line, the concentration of troops in threatened areas for defence and in certain directions for the offensive. The military power of Germany seems immense. On the French Atlantic coast, along the English Channel, an insurmountable rampart of steel and reinforced concrete. Behind it, reserve divisions are concentrated ready to thwart any attempt by the enemy to invade the continent. In the streets of Paris, the sound of marching German soldiers. In the south, a German soldier stands with a rifle to his leg. Aircraft and submarines based in Sicily and Crete control much of the Mediterranean Sea. In the Balkans, Hitler's and Mussolini's troops keep a new popular uprising from breaking out. True, as told by returning vacationers, Partisans in the mountains and forests of Yugoslavia give the German command trouble much more than officially recognised. In the east, the front line stretches from the Black Sea to the Arctic Ocean. But the situation here is not the same. In the north and on the central section of the Eastern Front, German troops are stopped, and only in the south are moving forward, as in the past year. The Soviet winter counteroffensive near Moscow had, of course, its effect on the balance of forces. Nevertheless, now we have something going on again. Soon there are also people who know how to explain everything that is happening. Our submarine fleet, they say, is invulnerable to all means of anti-submarine warfare. Our submarines cannot be detected by radar and sound catchers, cannot be detected from the air and hit by depth bombs. They catch up with their prey off the coast of Europe and America, cutting the vital nerve of the enemy. Squadrons of German bombers every day rise from their airfields and set course for England. 
They're delivering still sensitive blows on industrial installations and harbour facilities across the Channel. True, since the British strengthened their air defences with fighter aircraft and the air battle over England had to stop, successes have become more modest, but the bombing and destruction continues. There are three possibilities to defeat England as a world power, continue these knowledgeable people. Landing on its islands, the capture of India and decide the outcome of the war against England in West Asia. There is no navy to invade the islands. And in Burma, the Japanese have already crossed the Irrawaddy River and are knocking at the gates of India. So the only thing left is the Near East. We must reach it. One such attempt was made after the military defeat of France. French Syria was destined to become a springboard for the invasion of German troops in oil-bearing areas. It was enough only to cut the oil pipeline, through which the oil was pumped to the Mediterranean ports and would stop all British engines. But the hope that General Dens would bow as much to German arms as Marshal Pétain had done at Vichy was not realised. He joined Free France. Then the German High Command, in order to achieve their own, decided to use military force here too. Past Crete sailed transport ships with small landing crafts. Their goal was Syria, but they did not reach their goal. Near Cyprus, British submarines let some of them go down. The rest turned back and returned to their original ports. We on the Eastern Front officially knew nothing about these attempts, and now they intend to launch a new attempt. The African Corps is already a few kilometres from Alexandria. The regrouping of forces is underway. Cairo and the Suez Canal are in range. The second strike must come from Russian territory. The Caucasus, with its inexhaustibly rich sources of oil, the first target on this path. From here the enemy will be pinched. From here the war will move to its decisive stage. The fertile Kuban, the valleys of the snow-covered Caucasus mountains, Baku. This is where the striking wedge of German and Romanian troops is directed. Thus, a decisive blow to the Soviet military economy will be dealt. As they say, at one stroke, two beats two. But the approach to the Caucasus is narrow. Too narrow. Rostov-on-Don would remain under constant threat. We need a reliable flank. It's enough to glance at the map, and the second operational target suggests itself, Stalingrad. Its capture will give everything we need. Stalingrad in our hands, a reliable barrier to any possible danger. Possession of it means control over the vital artery of Russia, the Volga. The Soviet country would be cut in two. Stalingrad is one of the most important industrial centres. The loss of such major enterprises as Red October and Barricadi, as the Stalingrad tractor plant, would be a heavy blow to the military industry of the enemy, and in addition, greatly increased the prestige of German weapons. Such a victory, after the failure to deal with Moscow, we just need. Thus, the capture of Stalingrad will finally undermine the forces of the Russian Colossus and at the same time will ensure the implementation of a far-reaching plan of attack on the Caucasus. After the winter defeat, I thought, the most important thing for the OKH, to smash the Soviet Union. After all, he is still a danger to further plans. German general staff and this time developed their plans with Prussian pedantry and thoroughness, soberly and carefully weighed all the circumstances, provided for all the possibilities, prescribed everything down to the smallest detail. We seized the initial positions for this major blow immediately after the end of the battle for Kharkov. We already have experience. Communications are secured, reserves are ready. It remains only to press the button, and the operation will go according to the plan with clockwork precision. So far, everything has gone according to plan. Our 6th Army, under the command of General of Tank Forces Paulus with the first onslaught, threw the enemy from the Donets to Oskol and from Oskol, in a large bend of the Don. The battle at Kalak initially consolidated the capture of this territory. South of Voronezh, the entire right bank of the Don is in German hands. A strong, though overrated, position provides a deep flank for future operations. Fortune smiles upon us. Military fortune is on our side. The shadow of the German eagle is already hovering over the Volga. However, here on the Don, we have our own worries. 
our battle group, which should strengthen the defence of the 79th Infantry Division, consists of one sapper company, one self-propelled and mounted squadron. There are 27 machine guns. I am in command of the group. In addition, I have a battery of four howitzers, a mounted platoon, and an anti-tank platoon with only one gun, a 76mm trophy gun from France. The units averaged 75% of the regular staff, and the total number of soldiers barely 600. If you subtract from this number of artillery servants, communicators, messengers, clerks, orderlies and Captain Armasov, then for infantry fighting, I have some 330 active bayonets, including cavalrymen, which I ordered to dismount and take the defence. And with this number of men, I have to hold a section of 16.5 kilometres along the front. On both banks of the Don, the width of which here is 80 metres, stretches mixed forests passing into thickets of low shrubbery. In front of them stretches a slightly hilly step, in some places interspersed with potato fields. There are six settlements in our section. Behind, the terrain rises to the so-called Don Heights, reaching 60 metres. From here you can see every movement, and only the forest hides what is happening directly on the shore. Clearly my three companies to occupy the entire edge of the forest along the bank of the Don, I can not. Then every 50 metres would have only one soldier. Nor can I withdraw to the Don Heights, although from there it would be possible to keep the whole area under fire. It is much more important to control the forest, but since it is removed from the heights in some places two kilometres, this is possible only to a limited extent. There is only one solution. Occupy the villages, turn them into strongholds, send combat guards and reconnaissance teams to the intermediate zone, as well as directly to the river. It was said, done. The northern outskirts of the villages were fortified, in the most threatened places laid mines. But they are not enough. I let myself in a little military trickery, stretch across the terrain at a height of half a metre from the ground wire, and on it hang shields with the inscription, Caution, Mines, as if they were meant to warn our own soldiers of danger. Here our war suddenly begins to resemble, as an exception, peacetime exercises, when instead of mines and heavy weapons we put up shields and flags and took them seriously, as if they were real. And that's good. After all, the enemy greatly exceeds us in numbers and weapons. But he is cautious. Hard days and nights are coming. Under the cover of darkness, a unit consisting of Siberians of the 10-29th Regiment crosses the Don at midnight and attacks one of our strongholds on the right flank. In the night darkness sounds a formidable hurrah. Defending the village platoon cannot withstand the superiority of enemy forces and retreat to the heights. Telephone communication is interrupted. The battery has only 60 shells, and in this situation without observation, it cannot fire. It's pointless to send reinforcements. The width of the area and lack of visibility does not allow to do so. There is nothing left but to wait until morning. The first officer of the headquarters division, having received my report, rages. I draw your attention. You are personally responsible. Under no circumstances do not let the Russians seize the heights. Is that clear? He shouts into the phone. Mr. Lieutenant Colonel, if they advance further, I won't be able to stop them. In two hours they'll be at the division's CP. There's no one behind us. Stop joking. What are you going to do? At the moment, I can only hope that the Russians won't break through. We'll have to wait until morning. I'll take the village back during the day. A few hours of lingering suspense. The grey dawn is creeping up. The enemy has indeed stopped at the heights. He obviously does not know that we have only a thin line of small arms cells here, which he could break through with half of his forces. I hastily pull units from their strongholds and prepare a counter-attack. Behind remains only two or three soldiers with one machine gun in each village and shields. Beware, mines. Well, sometimes a trick helps, I think, and go into counter-attack. By evening, the former positions are back in our hands. The right bank of the Don is cleared. This game, 
Russians by night, us by day, is repeated two or three times a week. True, we manage each time to fully restore our section, but our combat effectiveness is noticeably decreasing. Daily I demand replenishment, and daily I am comforted that I will soon receive it. And the danger of a Russian breakthrough is still present. In order to mislead the enemy, I order every half hour to launch a truck at high speed on the road on the Don Heights. It drags a few straw mats behind it and raises a huge cloud of dust. It hangs over the step for 20 minutes and should give Russian observers the impression that whole columns of fresh troops are being thrown into the front line. But will this trick achieve its purpose? Perhaps the observers on the other side of the Don are just laughing at it. Meanwhile, in the area west of Kalash, there are feverish preparations for the offensive. There are command and staff exercises, reconnaissance of the terrain, convened meetings. Tanks and trucks are being checked. The last nuts are being screwed on. Everything is ready for the jump to the Volga. The 14th Tank Corps is tasked with the 16th Tank and two motorised infantry divisions, the 3rd and 60th, to capture the northern part of the city on the Volga, Stalingrad Nord. August 20th, the first officer of the headquarters of the 16th Panzer Division gives the last instructions. Commanders of units closely huddled over a map of the situation. Questions are posed, answers are given, the last fears are dispelled. There is an atmosphere of calm and confidence in success. Suddenly there is someone's dry voice. Major Gaidus, commander of the attached anti-aircraft artillery division, points to the newly delivered aerial photographs. Mr. Lieutenant Colonel, what are those white dashes that cross the roots of our tanks? The answer sounds cold and arrogant. I don't know that myself, Gaidus. Probably roads or maybe railroad lines. What's the use of racking your brains? We'll be there. We'll see. Little things like that won't hold us up. An empty excuse. But the faces, which had become preoccupied for a moment, brighten up again. There's nothing to doubt. The offensive will go like clockwork. We say goodbye. Handshakes, clicking of heels, short bows. The next day, the 295th Infantry Division is advancing at Luchensky across the Don, sappers on 112 assault boats forcing the river. Behind them, pontoons. Part of the crossing means shot by enemy fire. They are carried downstream. But the first groups have already firmly clung to the eastern bank. Almost 50 batteries are suppressing the enemy with their fire. On the approaching Russian tanks and attacking aircraft beat guns, installed directly on the open ground. Already captured the crossing, created a pre-bridge fortification. The offensive is developing to expand the bridgehead to concentrate troops on the east bank of the Don. Here have already appeared fresh engineer units. They begin to build bridges, build ferries, build piers. Motorboats are rushing across the Don. Their outboard engines are roaring. The first ferries are sailing, anchor chains are rattling, the bridge is growing. The fire of Russian artillery is increasingly concentrated on this point, but the work continues uninterrupted. Here is already ready the bridge to Peskovatka. The crossing number one for the 14th Tank Corps is set up, but to the north, near the village of Vertiaciego, still rages a fierce battle. On the night of August 23rd, tanks pass over the new temporary bridge and concentrate on the east bank to attack. At 3.05 a.m., all hell breaks loose. Tanks rush forward, dive bombers attack with a roar. The battle for Stalingrad has begun. The blood-red sun rises above the horizon. At five o'clock in the morning, Colonel General von Richthofen lands on his Storch near the observation post of the anti-aircraft division to direct the actions of aviation and air defence. The planes whizzed just a few metres above the ground ahead of the attacking tanks, overwhelming the enemy defences. Tank and motorised columns on the isthmus between the Don and the Volga are making their way further and further to the east. With the regulation of traffic across the bridge, things do not go well. The two-way traffic, which has begun too quickly, prevents the unimpeded crossing of the troops eagerly waiting for their turn on the western bank. At the approach to the bridge on the east bank of the Don, trucks with the wounded, tankers going to the rear for fuel, 
motorcyclists with important reports have already piled up. Cars with troops seeking the eastern bank of the Don, delayed at first for minutes. Minutes turn into hours, echelon and completeness of divisions intended for the offensive, violated. Nineteen hours, and on the eastern bank of the transferred not yet all the troops. Meanwhile, tank vanguards have already occupied the first settlements. More and more hundreds of workers of Stalingrad factories are fighting against them. The white strokes on the aerial photographs which Major Gaidus noticed turned out to be anti-tank ditches and equipped positions from which fierce resistance was now being fought. Not a bad surprise. But the Russians do not have the strength to resist the massive onslaught. Individual tanks brought into the battle by the enemy are hit. At 17 hours, our advanced units reach the tractor factory. Now they lack heavy weapons, artillery, anti-aircraft guns. They are in the third echelon, seeking to catch up with the advanced troops. But in spite of all the haste, they do not manage to unite. It's getting dark. Army headquarters, with feverish impatience, waiting for a report from General Vitasheim. What is the situation there? At 23 hours and 10 minutes, finally receives a radiogram. At 18.35 came to the Volga. It's already dark. There is still a fierce battle for Rhinoch. Large tank forces of the Russians are threatening from the north. Hastily created cut-off positions. Resistance of the enemy has increased, and therefore it was not possible to throw him far enough and occupy the village of Azovka. Be that as it may, the Russians are holding on. In the south, Orlovka is still not taken. Thus, only an extremely narrow corridor has been created. While in front, fiercely fighting for decisive positions, comes the message that the Russians blocked the path of our troops. The forward units of the 14th Panzer Corps are fighting in an encirclement. Communications are cut. The western flank is open, quickly made a calculation of forces. It turns out that in addition to the 1th Panzer Division in full force in place, there is only the 8th Infantry Regiment. Motorised divisions can allocate only part of their forces. Critical days and nights are coming. On the sixth day, ammunition is already running low. Accompanied by ten tanks, just out of repair, a transport convoy of 250 trucks manages to break through the Russian barrier lines and deliver ammunition, fuel and food to the boiler. Several trucks fall into Russian hands. The units left behind are fighting continuously with the aim of connecting. Each recaptured meter is immediately strengthened. On the cut-off positions are thrown up all new forces. Finally, communication with the surrounded, restored. Begins systematic equipment of the northern cut-off position. Despite the strongest raids of Russian bombers in the last nights of August, it continues to strengthen. The first Russian onslaught is repulsed. The defence is holding. A few days earlier, the 4th Tank Army with its 48th Tank Corps forced the Don River in the lower reaches and from the south came to Lake Tsatsa. It had a task, to get through Bekatovka to the southern part of Stalingrad. Stalingrad Zayud. After persistent fighting for Height 118, during which the 14th and 24th Panzer Divisions suffered significant losses, the tank corps remains to Krasnoarmaisk only eight kilometres. But large Russian forces and a belt of minefields two to three kilometres deep stop the tank rampart. The plan changes. A guard line is created and the main forces of the corps on the night of August 26-27 are withdrawn back. They come in from the Aksai side and begin to break through to Stalingrad from the south. In the first days of September, the outlines of the city appear before the eyes of tankers. In the past summer months, it was rarely possible to take prisoners. Their number increased only once, during the battles for Kalach. But how can we compare it with the last year? Maybe the Russians retreated systematically? Well, we don't care. After all, this time the goal is not the destruction of their armies, but the capture of a certain point on the geographical map the mastery of a large bend of the Volga. A wave of German troops is approaching the city in a giant cloud of dust. Cars, tanks, scooters, equestrians, infantrymen, all rushed to one goal. 
all of them together must in the shortest possible time to ensure the success of the operation. True, there are disturbing rumours. It is said that around the city day and night digging trenches, and in the basements equip military hospitals. Perhaps. But everything else, of course, is greatly exaggerated, as if every house is turning into a doge, and every window into an embrasure with a predetermined sector of fire. Nothing. These rumours will immediately dissipate as soon as our troops begin a decisive assault on the city. It is not the first time that a decisive battle of grandiose scale takes place in this point of Russia. But few of us know about it. It was news to me that it was here, at Tsaritsyn, as this city was called then. The Red Battalions defeated the White Guards. There were hot fights here, and if, our interpreter told me, there were still survivors of the Tsaritsyn in defence, then we should be ready for anything. Division after division is advancing on Stalingrad. Wedges breaking through from the southwest are already reaching the southern outskirts of the city. On the central section of the whole day are fighting to break through to the city from the west. But stubborn, incredibly stubborn resistance of the Stalingrad inhabitants. The fight is not even for streets, not for neighbourhoods. Every cellar, every staircase is being defended. All day long the battle is fought for one single stairwell. Hand grenades flying from room to room. Here we already seem to have seized this floor, it is firmly in our hands, but no, the enemy received reinforcements on the burning roofs, and again the close combat breaks out. Artillery and squadrons of bombers turn the city into a pile of stone, on the residential buildings and factories continuously hurricane fire. Fifty German soldiers storm the nearest house. A few hours later it is taken, but twenty of them are killed. Two more houses, and the last surviving soldier, wheezing, calls for help. Yes, Stalingrad is devouring German soldiers. Every metre costs lives. More and more battalions are thrown into the battle, and the next day only a platoon remains. Slowly, very slowly, the divisions are moving forward through the ruins and piles of rubble. In some places they have already reached the Volga. But the soldiers, clinging to the last strength to the still-preserved walls of the houses, with great difficulty hold such a hard-won position. Replacements are made, small reinforcements are thrown in, but there are not enough forces for the decisive assault. We need replenishment. Replenishment, and once again, replenishment. Commanders write requests, try to get them personally. But there are no reinforcements. Wait. In the meantime, the enemy is strengthening its positions. Three quarters of the city is already in the hands of the Germans. The rest of the Russian defensive positions, including the territory of the factory, in a semi envelope. The crossings across the Volga, connecting these parts of the city with the other bank, are under fire. Despite this, the enemy, albeit at the cost of great sacrifices, still manages to throw in new forces to strengthen its defences. Sixth Army is no longer able to remove fresh units from other areas and throw them to the Volga. Everywhere you look, everywhere the divisions defending the flanks are engaged in a fierce battle with the continuously advancing Russians. The first marching battalions are arriving. Right from the train, they are thrown into battle. This only adds fuel to the fire. The exhausting battle continues. After the Red Army manages to create in the bend of the Don, at Serafimovich, pre-bridge fortification on the West Bank, the commander of our 79th Infantry Division orders all available and possible forces to level the front line. The company of one of my best officers, Oberleutnant Kiel, who has been in the battalion since the beginning of the war, has been included in the attacking party. It was now almost completely destroyed after an attack on terrain overgrown with stunted shrubbery. The company commander and two platoons did not return from the battle. Killed and missing in Action, Marx Hauptfeld Feeble against their names in the list of personnel. It's especially hard for me. For two and a half years I myself commanded this company. Two days later, the adjutant calls me to the telephone. The general himself wants to talk to me. The Russians have broken through to our left. We don't have details yet. I believe they've made it as far as Kalmykove. That means an open flank for us. Tonight, mine that gap. 
I'm quickly working out in my mind what I need to do. Mr. General, it's hardly possible. We don't have enough minds. We don't have enough minds. Well, you understand? The most dangerous places must be mined. The rest is up to you. It's good for him to talk from behind. We rarely see him on the front line. And when he calls, he gives orders we can't fulfil. Orders like that only create new holes. Mr. General, my best non-commissioned officers and specialist Minutemen are out of action. My hands are empty. Things will improve soon. We just have to hold out today, my dear. Walter Fierek, my adjutant, he heard the whole conversation, looks at me doubtfully. I shrug my shoulders. First I have to get my bearings. Calling back and forth, the picture is scary. Either our neighbour on the left, the Italian division, Celer, missed the preparation of the enemy to attack, or the pressure of the Russians was so strong that we too would not hold if we were in his place. In any case, large forces of the Russians wedged into the front line of defence, and you called a real panic. At this point, it is difficult to say whether it will be possible to stop the retreat. For our division, the situation is really more than serious. We're thinking about what to do. We only have a few hundred mines. That's enough to start with. But where to get sappers? The soldiers with whom I started the war three years ago have long since fallen on battlefields across Europe. The survivors can be counted on their fingers. All new faces. People who have only learned to distinguish an anti-tank mine plate from an anti-personnel mine, and not to speak of the fact that to understand the fuses of pressure, percussion and tension action, and not to speak of. But that's the way it is everywhere in our army. Firak's face is desperate, sweat beading on his forehead. Finally, we make a plan. With the onset of darkness, companies will send groups of barricades and mine those places where the most likely tank attack of the enemy. I'm calling Field Feeble Wrath to me. This is the commander of the last platoon of my old company, a shot miner, knows his business. Let him take over the most dangerous point, then everything will be all right. Five hours later. In the glow of a huge step fire, I read an urgent report, just delivered by a non-commissioned officer standing in front of me. Suddenly, a tremendous explosion shakes everything around me. The blast wave throws us back a few metres with terrible force. Something happened up ahead. But what? I jump into the cross-country car and rush across the step. The grass is on fire. Everything around us seems to be filled with Bengal fire, and it makes us rush with even greater speed. I'm trying to figure it out. Clearly, something's happened to Rata's group. Impatiently, I step on the foot of the car to make the driver go even faster. A wagon without a driver is passing by, the reins dragging on the ground. A shadow rushes towards the car from the right. Mr. Captain? Mr. Captain? It's the cart man. Gasping, he reports. I brought 42 mines to that fork in the road. Feldfebel Rath ordered to unload them. Then each soldier took two, one under the right arm, one under the left. They went in a line, quite a bunch. I saw it all clearly. They were going against the fire. I was about to leave, and then there was a bang, the like of which I had never seen in my life. The horses took off, and I followed them. I don't know anything else, Mr. Captain. I'm on my way. Here it is, this fork. I jump off, follow the trail, clearly visible in the tall grass. Yes, that's right, in this gully we should have laid a minefield. I duck to the ground so that the enemy would not see me over the burning grass and sneak further. The trail breaks off. In front of me is a large burned rectangle. I call out. No one responds. No movement. I throw over the ominous rectangle. No further tracks. Searching, running around. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I start looking all over the surrounding area. And then I find all that's left of Rath's platoon. Scraps of cloth and a few pieces of torn bodies. Nothing else. A chill runs down my spine. No, it can't be. Twenty-six people can't disappear from the face of the earth in an instant. Disappear forever. Not so long ago, I talked to Field Fleur Rath, to Sergeant Bornman. They were the same as always. They were thinking. They were grumbling. And now, just a few hours later, 
they are no longer alive, and soon grief and mourning will enter their homes. Their last letters have not even had time to go home yet. When they receive them at home and rejoice at the long-awaited news from the front, few people here will remember Rata's platoon. Other worries will come, more important ones, and there in Germany, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, they will sit and reread the letter of the soldier, not even knowing that he is already dead. For his loved ones he is still alive. Soldiers are dead only for us for now, more specifically for me. I must inform the others. I must arrange for the families of the dead to be notified. Some of the letters I will have to write myself. But what can I say to comfort Bornemann's wife, for instance? Why does she need empty words about the heroism of her deed husband or about the Führer, the people and the Reich? The wife wants to know how her husband died and above all what he gave his life for. What should I write to her? I cannot tell her the brutal truth. Then this explosion will sound in her ears forever. I must lie as I have lied so often during this war. Yes, that's the way it is. We lose people day after day, and when someone dies we hide the truth of his death from others. Until now I have tried to ignore the deaths of individual soldiers. One death, one letter, one cross over the grave. It can still be endured. But here a whole platoon was killed. Twenty-six deaths at once, which means you have to lie twenty-six times. This is terrifying, tears the veil of lies, throws aside all the old rules of the game of truth. How can we still adhere to these rules when we have to say goodbye to three departments at once? Let the loved ones of the dead have their funeral letters written by those who sit farther back in the rear, say the general, who a few hours ago so easily dispelled my fears. The situation will soon improve. What to him? He knew neither Rath nor Bornemann. He was only interested in the hole that had to be plugged. I get in the car again, and it takes me to the command centre. I don't say a word the whole way. My driver, Tony, doesn't say a word. My mind is racing. I'm slowly painting a picture of what happened. Probably Rath and his 25 soldiers were too close together. The flames of the step fire illuminated them, and they came into sight of the Russians. A mortar attack, a direct hit, one of the mines detonates, and all 42 saucers explode at once. Torn to shreds, the whole platoon disappeared from the face of the earth, leaving one bloody stain. The search undertaken the next morning yielded no results. Funeral letters were written. They are no different from the usual ones. High-flown words strung one on top of the other, with the truth buried underneath. As always, each of the dead was a brave soldier of the Führer. As always, each of them believed that he died for the best cause in the world. Not a word about the explosion, not a word I do not write about the other dead. Let the mothers learn about it later, when some vacationer tells them what a terrible death their sons died. What will they say then? Two days later, we are standing at the soldiers' cemetery in Verknefominskoye. In front of us are 26 fresh graves. Above each is a cross with a name and date. Parents will get a picture and think that here their son is resting in eternal sleep. Only we know that the graves are empty and the remains of 26 people would be barely enough for five. So in a few days, an entire company ceased to exist New soldiers would come, they would try to fill the gap, but they can't replace Kiel, Rath and Bornman. And the Russians don't give us time. The circle of old soldiers is getting tighter and tighter. They've been marching all over Europe for years and now they're dying one by one. Who knows whose turn it will be tomorrow? The war here is very different from what we've experienced before. How will it go on? The situation will soon improve the general barked into the telephone receiver. He doesn't know what it's like here on the front line. Those 26 are better off. At least they didn't have to suffer the agony of death. It's all behind them now. Best of all, a bullet in the head. But no, we can't give in to such thoughts. We want to survive. We want to go home. Otherwise, why do we seek shelter, dig into the ground when heavy shells burst around us, throw ourselves into craters? 
It is in the midst of danger, when every second threatens death, that the desire to survive at all costs is born. We must return home. We want something more out of life. We want into the arms of our wife or bride. Everything else for us are empty words, beautiful phrases, all sorts of twists and turns that belong only in novels. Commanders, Chief of Operations and Chief of Rear of the Division, are looking into the future more and more anxiously. Our division has exhausted its forces. It must be taken to the rear for rest and replenishment. Everyone is united in this opinion. And although it is said only in a narrow circle, it becomes the property of the soldiers. Rumours creep from village to village, from position to position. Some talk about resting in Belgorod, others about transfer to southern France. To my direct question, I receive from the general an answer in comparison with which the prophecy of some Pythia of the Temple of Apollo of Delphi could seem a model of crystal clarity. Complete uncertainty reigns, opening a wide space for all sorts of fantastic assumptions. In the midst of this uncertainty suddenly appear reconnaissance groups and teams of quartiers of Romanian units. They tell of a whole army approaching from the south, as if cavalcades are already rushing through the whole of southern Ukraine and columns of fresh troops are only five days' march away from us. That's the clue. The Sphinx stops smiling mysteriously and finally pronounces the long-awaited change of units. Plots, strongholds and obstacles are transferred on the ground and on the map. Day and night there are command meetings. Two or three more days, and the matter is over. The last soldier of our division will leave the front line. September 21. Conversation with the head of the Operational Department of the Division Headquarters. On his map, he shows me the situation in the neighbouring area. Arrived from the Northwest Tank, Battalion plays these days the role of a kind of fire department, bailing out the Italians. The Lieutenant Colonel shines with joy. In a day, everything will be all right again, one less thing to worry about. And in a couple more days, we'll no longer care about the front. Yes, listen, I just remembered. Go to the General, you're in luck. A quarter of an hour later, I'm sitting in my car, happy and smiling. In my clipboard, I have a vacation certificate, a fare card and a trip ticket to Kharkov. I will leave the day after tomorrow, although according to the schedule, the train for vacationers leaves only on October 2nd. Or maybe I will manage to take a plane, then I will save a lot of time. In my mind, I am already in Germany, where they are waiting for me. My wife will be happy. After all, in a few days, she will hear my voice on the phone. While our troops on the Don are enduring hard trials day after day, and a few hundred kilometres to the east, in the quarters of Stalingrad, the battle is rumbling, I am driving west along the dusty roads. To the right and left is the rural landscape, Women and girls are working in the fields. From time to time our car has to take a sharp right to miss the columns of troops moving towards the front. They are Romanians, fresh, strong soldiers, but you can see from their faces that they did not choose their own route, leading them into battle. Excellent horses, long necks and powerful croups glisten in the sun, but the armament is outdated and in a war such as the present one has rather only moral force. The 37mm anti-tank guns that are rolling eastward truly belong only in a museum. They showed their unsuitability even during the winter offensive. The Soviet tanks simply flattened them. The next day, I am already on the airfield Kharkov Nord. I was lucky. Together with nine non-commissioned officer Emit, they gave me a place in a liaison plane, which was flying to Vinitsa. We could only fly, and from there we would somehow get there. The weather is good, the airplane is gaining more and more altitude, the cabin trembles from the rumble. There are fields, forests, roads, rivers below. This is Ukraine. A year ago there were battles raging here and we were in the thick of them. Now it passes in front of us like in a movie. Everywhere you look there is black earth. This is the land, which in the course of centuries beckoned to itself many foreign kings and rulers, and survived the invasion of many robber hordes. It is only worth reading a history book. In it you will read about the Greeks and the Goths and the Huns and the Scandinavian Vikings, 
who built their castles on the banks of the Dnieper and Bati and the Golden Horde, which squeezed the sweat out of many generations of peasants, dressing at the expense of their labour in silk and velvet. It was here that military fortune finally changed Swedish king Charles the Finthine. German troops visited this land back in the First World War, and then Pilsudski. Ukraine is a rich land, a huge breadbasket. They say that recently, in the circle of high officers, Goebbels spoke about its great value. After the great victories won in the West, Germany since 1940 has to feed the whole Europe alone. And since the planned new order with an empty stomach is not established, the German leadership had to attack the Soviet Union in 1941 and seize Ukraine. We're landing. Emig takes his things wrapped in a trench coat, I, a suitcase. We get out of the airplane. Along a shady alley, a bus takes us into the city. We enter Vinitsa. Here is the headquarters of the Supreme Command and the location of a number of higher bodies. Behind the facades of nice-looking houses, life flows, reminiscent of the pace and feverishness of some Western European capital. As if in Berlin on Unter den Linden, cars rush along the sidewalk, big, bigger and huge, not paying the slightest attention to pedestrians crossing the street. In the cars sit the highest Nazi officials, staring haughtily from under half-lidded eyelids. The new, freshly pressed uniforms are designed to emphasise the importance of their existence and the greatness of their tasks. Brown uniforms with gold and eagles sit super elegantly on their well-fed bodies. The gaunt frontline officers hanging around the streets waiting for the next train that will take them on. Leave to Germany are simply not noticed and certainly not honoured. We respond in the same way more than once mentally seeing off these brown and gold heroes with an unkind word. Two or three of us meet slender female soldiers, Amazons in grey-blue uniforms, curls curling from under their pilots' caps, which are smartly moved to the back of their heads. They seem to be the inevitable companions of the rear men, but from time to time they glance at us. We do not care about them. They are waiting for us at home. In the headquarters of the High Command, I meet my old friend, Captain Rominger. Opening one of the many doors, I suddenly see him right in front of me. He is a little taller than me, blonde hair combed back, energetic chin slightly forward. He hasn't changed at all. Even with the big jingling spurs, he wore them, I believe, as a boy on his father's estate. For some years, we had served in the same garrison, standing in formation in the same barracks yard and riding together, sometimes inviting each other to drink good wine. But all this was a long time ago. In Belgium, Rominger was severely wounded. Instead of his right hand, he has a prosthesis. Now he is an adjutant to a general. As I heard, every night from Vinitsa leaves the courier train, arriving in Berlin in 36 hours. I put a ticket for a sleeping car in my breast pocket, Rominger closes his shop and says, Well, now I invite you to our officer's casino. You must be hungry. He takes me under his arm. It's a short walk. And soon we enter a not very large room, tastefully furnished, with comfortable chairs and tables covered with white tablecloths. Two tables are occupied. Officers in high ranks and with unimpressive faces take their eyes off their glasses of sparkling wine and respond to my greeting with a nod of the head, casting rather critical glances at my uniform. Come and sit in that corner over there. For God's sake, don't think of impressing these people. They're not worth it. Some people hang around here just because they have a nephew in the SS. Does it matter that much to you? Yes, it does. I'd be amazed if I'd stick my nose behind the scenes. You know the German soldiers' precepts, willpower, zeal and patronage. It's still valid here. The bailiff brings Benedictine, the wine stimulates the appetite, then all sorts of food is served. Yes, the vacation has begun and not badly. And a nice Brazilian cigar to go with it. Rominger talks about his adjutant service. He talks about it with laughter and sadness. On the one hand, it is not bad to see things on a large scale and know quite a lot. On the other, it's depressing to sit more or less inactive. Then he utters the words I least expected to hear in such a high headquarters. 
Rominger feels like a stranger here. He has his own opinion about everything. Successes do not make a big impression on him. He does not pay much attention to what the radio and the press report about them. After all, he knows very well what losses are paid for our advancement. Maybe he has already realised that these losses are irreplaceable. Rominger unleashes his wrath on all those who act as if all this does not play a role, as if all this is unimportant. The resignation of Golda, which was announced just today, he explains that it was these people who prevailed. Who will succeed Holder as Chief of General Staff, he does not know yet. Probably one of those generals who always give in and say Amen on any occasion, some careerist, full of energy and optimism, unconditionally agreeing with any adventurist plan of his Führer. Nevertheless, my interlocutor still believes in victory. His opinion, in short, is this. A few more months and the war will be over. If it drags on, things will go downhill. Time is not working for us. And the propaganda just keeps on talking. As if everything goes on as before. As if there was no last winter. As if we have long ago cut the vulgar. Rominger draws my attention to the fact that we are beginning to rely more and more on the genius of Hitler, that in the military departments and command bodies are increasingly planted people who are unconditionally loyal to him. This inspires apprehension. I couldn't agree more with Rominger. I had to see how many people were gagged, how they grovelled before Hitler, how success achieved at any cost became the only measure of right and wrong, One's own thoughts, one's own opinion and one's own understanding have long since become superfluous. He thinks and acts for everyone. And if a failure, no one, neither officers nor soldiers, do not think about its causes. After all, Hitler thinks and acts for them too. Rominger's words sobered me. Yes, it's all exactly like that. You walk for years in a marching column, risking your life, seeing others fall beside you and you think, it's all for Germany. You wait and don't get reinforcements and there are whole crowds of people who have never even sniffed the front line. They're setting the tone, they're pushing us forward. No, really, you shouldn't let us frontline soldiers go on vacation. Whoever has seen what goes on here in the rear, whoever has heard how decisions are made here, will return to the front disbelieving. They command from here, disregarding the lessons and experience of past campaigns, and we have to deal with it. My God, I haven't even been to my homeland yet, and I would like to return. Suddenly our lively conversation is interrupted. A general appears in the doorway. Grey hair, stern demeanour. My old man, says Rominger, jumping up. Sit down, Rominger. You have a guest from the front? The general comes to our table, sits down. Conversation begins, cautious and deliberately neutral. Rominger, who had just expressed his fears to me, becomes calm and businesslike, but everything is buzzing in him, excited and the general. The resignation of Golder, it seems, left no one indifferent. In the conversation slips and immediately disappear barely noticeable notes of reproach. One gets the impression that no one trusts the other and is afraid of being overheard by someone invisible. The casino room fills up. It's lunchtime. Doors open and close. Chairs and tables are pushed up. Plates clatter. Knives and forks clink. A doctor with the rank of colonel sits down with us. He joins our conversation and tells us about a department head he has just visited on business. Imagine, we sit with him opposite each other. We are separated only by a desk. We're having a conversation. He doesn't like a lot of things that are going on right now. He especially doesn't like Golda's resignation. There's a call. He's been summoned for a report. There's a 180 degree turn in my sweet colonel. He frantically digs through the papers, stuffs his leather folder with sheets with red and blue stamps, secret and top secret, and then, under all sorts of pretexts, escorts me out. Almost everyone is like that. First, they open their mouths and start cursing everything, and as soon as the bosses press the button, their mouths shut. A kind of paralysis of will has spread. In reality, it's just a pathetic cowardice, fear of their own excitement. 
everyone's afraid of losing their seat. But the medical colonel himself is in essence only a resonator, nothing more. Does he act differently from those he scolds? Tomorrow the phone will ring on his desk and he too will rush to his superiors. And how are we different from him? We are all the same. We condemn certain forms or individuals we don't like. Sometimes it's Hitler, but probably only because he didn't graduate from the military academy. Sometimes it's the SS whom we don't like because they enjoy privileges. That's all there is to it. And there is no question of how the matter should proceed. The general considers it a good thing to avoid such a conversation. He stands up and asks me to escort him to his office. Five minutes later, I stand with him in front of the map of the situation on the Eastern Front. Stalingrad is no longer a problem here. It will fall in a few days. The general looks with satisfaction at the continuous blue line, which, closely adjoining the Don, this elegant curl captures the Volga. The bright blue of the Don is intrusive to the eye. You see, dear captain, the coming winter does not frighten us. This time we have such positions from which no one can knock us out. And where is your unit located here at Serafimovich? That's right, it's a good position, isn't it? With the Don as a water barrier right in front of our noses, you couldn't ask for anything better. I'll explain briefly how great the losses are and what specific orders were given to us on the Don. Permit me to remark, Mr General, that the present front line, according to our experience, is unfit to serve as a winter position. As soon as the Don freezes over, we will have no time to look back before one day the Russians with tanks and everything else will be in front of our weakly fortified points. I see this as a serious danger. Such considerations seem to the general something completely new. He is clearly counting on forces that we have long been absent. Rominger's doubts, which I was sceptical of at first, are confirmed. Apparently, here and really no one bothers reports and operational reports, which we send daily to the division headquarters. From there they are passed on, and they must eventually get to this table. But apparently they never get here. Is it possible that what we write is crossed out on the way? By whom? Or do we no longer have generals who report the truth? It's midnight. I'm sitting in the compartment of the courier train, Venezia, Berlin. It consists of two sleeping cars and a dining car. The seats in the train are occupied by generals, officers of the general staff, SS Führer and all sorts of Sonderführer, Nazi party grandees, intendant, military judges, and other officials of all ranks and shades. Yes, the gentlemen have a good life in the rear. Only once in a while you notice a lone frontline officer. He's either returning from a report to his command, or he, like me, was lucky enough to find a way to get home quickly on his short vacation. Besides me in the compartment is a tank colonel who was transferred to the west. We get acquainted, but the conversation doesn't go well. Both are too tired. We fall asleep, and the train rushes us through the Russian forests to our homeland without stopping. The next morning I feel like a newborn. I've finally slept well. Together with my neighbour we go to the restaurant car. Suddenly a voice stops me. Why do not salute? I turn around. At the door of the compartment stands a young man with a haughty face. Noticing the general's pants, I almost clicked my heels, but then I saw the blue-blue collar of his uniform and white buttonholes with oak branches. Good heavens, what in the world can happen? A Sonderführer in the rank of general. Right, one of those who go to count the harvest. I replied sharply, leave that tone. And without looking at the dumbfounded official, I follow the smiling colonel. Smoking coffee is already waiting for us. They serve white bread, rolls, butter, ham, sausage, eggs and jam. Our appetite is not bad, and we eat the general's breakfast without ceremony. The mood is excellent. The sun is shining brightly, promising a pleasant vacation. We talk casually about all sorts of military affairs, discussing the situation on all fronts. The next day the train arrives at Berlin Friedrichstrasse station at exactly the appointed time. Fresh, well-fed and invigorated, we part from each other. Gloomy houses, asphalt, billboards, cars whizzing by, 
passers-by hurrying by, an electric train rumbling overhead. Scraps of phrases are drowned out by the noise of the city. People crowd the crosswalks, red light, green light, hurry across the street, central hotel. Where can I make a phone call? Bell floor, right, then left. Thank you. I'm ordering an emergency call. I get it in ten minutes. I hear my wife's distant voice interrupted with joy. In five hours, meet me at the main station in Breslon. A few hours like eternity. And here I am already joyfully hugging my wife. Months of waiting and the heaviness of separation are behind me. I am met by a real smiling life, the old, familiar and dear world. After all, with me next to me, in real life, my wife walks with a girlish gait and quietly shakes my hand. It's like I'm drunk. So is she. Her face breathes with happiness that I am near. Every few steps she casts a glowing glance at me. Yes, I'm with you. It's not a dream. But the words aren't coming. The war has made me so rough and harsh that I'm afraid lest I destroy what I still have left the last drop of happiness and human warmth. And my wife, too, seems to feel that the sharp contours of harsh reality must recede into the background at this hour of our meeting. I am grateful to her for not asking me anything. What could I say? I can't tell her today how Field Fleeble Wrath was killed with his entire platoon in the blink of an eye. The shadows of the twenty-six crosses would have stood between us for three weeks, and I myself would have been a dead man on leave, stinking of grave cold. No, there are things that cannot be said. The few days given to us by fate will pass quickly, and then back to the front, where a small, very small shell fragment can cut short a life. That's why it is better to understand each other without words, not to break this, maybe the last, meeting with careless words. And yet there is something left unspoken between us, but even it warms me when I think of the cold metal of guns and mines. I jump up. Where is the adjutant? Has the second company arrived? Slanting rays of sunlight fall through the window. What is this room? Where am I? I look around. Yes, it's not a dream. I'm on vacation. In Breslau. In a hotel. I stretch with pleasure. My wife is still asleep, breathing evenly. Her face hasn't changed over the years, but it has become almost alien to me. There's a different person beside me. This woman looks so deceptively like my wife. Yes, just like her. But no, it can't be her. I have nothing to do with her. I'm getting chills. No, I can't believe it. Yesterday I felt she was someone close to me. And now? Or am I mistaken? Here are the clothes, the suitcases, there are the paintings, here is the furniture. And it's all in its place. Just me and my military uniform. We alone are strangers here. I suddenly begin to feel unforgivably invaded, unwanted, like a stranger being pointed at the door. What's the matter with you? There are eyes looking at me anxiously, eyes that warm me. They call to me. They are familiar to me. It's the wife. Yes, she is with me. Her voice sounds in my ears. I'm home again. The nightmare is gone. We wander the streets of the ancient city in the wee hours of the evening. I want to look around, see and remember as much as possible. Who knows when the next time I'll get a vacation. This is the street where I used to run to school every day. Here, in this cafe, I sat with my first love. It was a bright and joyful time. Every street comes alive in my memory. This house and the one across the street, every corner has its own past for me. Memories pull their threads through the hustle and bustle of the city. I look around, but the grey stone hulks of the houses are cold and silent. Somewhere a door slams. Somewhere far behind me a window pane flies out. I clung tighter to my wife. Old man, how you've changed. Someone calls out to me. It's my school friend. He asks, How's it going? And doesn't even wait for an answer, flooding me with a stream of cheerful words. You know, I wanted to join the Wehrmacht too, but unfortunately I'm indispensable. 
They won't let me go to the front. I'm armoured. The farm needs people too. I have to put up with it. I just envy you, those of you on the front lines. That's life, isn't it? Something to remember. You and I would have found common ground in the offensive. Do you think so too, old sport? I don't think that at all. I'm not even listening. Stand back. Don't interfere with my happiness. I want to shout to him. I don't want anything to do with you. Stay the way you are. I don't want you there. Keep memorising newspaper phrases about heroism and leave me alone. I hear my wife say, Unfortunately, we're in a big hurry. Invited to visit. Or something like that. And we move on. After a few days in Breslau, we go to Koblenz, where we rest already in our own apartment. We don't want to hear anything, see anything. But you can't escape reality. They start to ask you about the affairs at the front, then you receive letters, then you see morning notices in the newspapers. Everyone feels tired, everyone longs for peace. Winter is already knocking at the door, and the set goals are still not achieved. In the narrowest of circles, people are voicing their fears and concerns. When visiting my rear unit, the 44th Reserve Engineer Battalion, it strikes me that there are a disproportionate number of officers hanging out on the barracks square and especially in the casino. I ask Oberleutnant Vergès from my battalion, who was maimed at the front, how such a thing is possible now. He replies, We have 50 or 60 officers in our battalion, and the training of soldiers is engaged in 20 people, no more. The rest, as a rule, are on vacation. As soon as we are preparing to send new recruits to the Eastern Front, they immediately remember about all their ailments, complain of unbearable pains and manage to get it written down for a few weeks, only fit for garrison service. And in the evening there is a party on this occasion. Twenty-two-year-old Oberleutnant, in response to my words that I want to take him to the front, says, What haven't I seen there? My chest is already covered with orders, and that's the main thing for me. You'll manage to finish the war without me. Besides, as a tutor, Fenrikovia is indispensable now. They won't let me go even if I want to. Then he tells me about life in the garrison town. The shortage of men caused by the war means, as he puts it, a favourable situation in the sense of supply and demand, for some, but for men like him, it is a magnet that draws them to the rear. So this is what they are like, the officers who prepare our recruits for us. And this is an example for the recruits, to whom they say something about the greatness of the tasks. But who will believe this empty talk? Who can be convinced by it when there is such a gap between words and deeds? How should a soldier feel about going to the front, knowing that his tutors and officers are trying by any means possible to cling to the rear or to get a transfer to France, where the reserve units are also located? Rominger told me the purpose of the reserve battalions in occupied countries. They are needed there as a military force by the government plenipotentiaries, to put the industry and agriculture of the captured countries at the service of the Great War, to drive into the depopulated German gaudy labour force and put behind bars anyone who thinks and acts differently. On our street, in the house across the street, one of those who think and act differently also lives. Two years ago, this owner of a construction company said to his client, You can say hello to me without a Heil Hitler or an outstretched hand. Here we just say to each other, good afternoon. He was quickly taken away and sent to a concentration camp where he had a chance to reflect for a year on his excessive frankness. Now he's home again, but people shun him. No one wants to compromise themselves by associating with him. I went to see him. It was a complete surprise for him. He considers all officers to be Nazis. For the first time, I learned in detail what a concentration camp is. On the gate is a cast-iron inscription, to each his own. Here, each other means inhuman labour, beatings and liquid soup. What he told me about the SS in no way agrees with what the press writes about these select troops day after day. But who knows if he is not exaggerating? On the other hand, what is the point of him trying to mislead me? Anyway, I should have found out more about it. 
The next day I met Lieutenant Franz in the street. He was a platoon commander in our first company. He had been wounded six months before, in the spring, when we were fighting off the Russian offensive on the Donets. An officer who was loved by the soldiers. Outside the service, a good storyteller, he did not lose his head in battle and in any situation kept the presence of mind. Small clashes with him occurred only when he went to Mellow Declamation, and from the height of his 26 years began to teach us about what National Socialism is. But it never came to a serious confrontation. We knew him and thought, let him talk. In the meantime, it seems that he has quite recovered from his wound. He is well dressed, his eyes shine from under his cap. I'm glad to see him again. Well, how are you? All right again? Yes, Mr. Captain. I was discharged from the hospital a month ago. How's the arm? More or less. The bone's a little crooked, but it'll do. And one of my fingers was taken off. It's a blessing in disguise, Mr. Captain. At that time, I wouldn't have given a penny for my hand. Yes, it was a shitty business. Well, congratulations are in order. Thank you, Mr. Captain. Where is our division now? It's hard to know the situation at the front here. We're defending on the Don. Or rather, we were. I don't know where I'll find my unit when I get back. Can you still use me, Mr. Captain? I want to go to the front by all means. I can't stand what's going on here. I'd be glad to take you with me, Franz. But whether you're fit again, I can't decide. See a doctor. I don't want to hang around here any longer. I want to go to my old comrades. Well, you won't find many of them alive. Franz is worried, but I can't help him. Only his battalion can solve this issue. A few hours later, Franz shows up at my house. He has achieved his goal and shows me a travel order signed by the commander of the reserve battalion. Well, gee, welcome. But first, you have to go home for a week. Let the office write you a leave certificate, and I'll sign it if you come back in two or three hours. Late at night, we sit with him. The wife tries to show the young camaraderie. Franz tells her he's only been married a few weeks. He is glad that tomorrow he will make his young wife happy with his unexpected arrival. She's in poor health, complaining of heart trouble. But that won't keep him in the rear. It is his duty to fight for fatherland on the front line, with weapons in his hands, because victory is already tangibly close. Despite his severe injury, he remained as unbridled optimist as he was. Everything that the press writes for him, the absolute truth. Nothing. Soon the hard facts will open his eyes. We part well past midnight. My wife feels tired. She's had enough war talk for one day. We spend the last days of my vacation back in Breslau. The mood is not good here either. Everyone wants the war to end, and no one can understand the wastefulness that the authorities allow themselves when everything is in short supply. They talk about the speech that the Gauleiter of Lower Silesia, Hanke, made recently in the Hall of the Thousand Year Empire. He was most concerned with the question of restaurants. He said roughly the following, as Gauleiter, I must be able to represent myself with dignity. And in the whole of Breslau, there is not a single decent restaurant to which one could invite guests from abroad or from another country in the evening. That's why I ordered to build a bar worthy of the capital of Silesia. I expect the necessary understanding from all Volksgenossen. On the Gauleiter's orders in the midst of the war, masons, carpenters and architects, specialists in interiors, built a luxurious bar. The furniture, carpets, curtains, even the place where the gentlemen recover after heavy libations, everything is in the same style. The visitor was transported into an atmosphere of luxury and prosperity. Gauleiter, who so boasted of his close connection with the people, ordered to let in this miracle bar only by special passes. I involuntarily remembered everything I had seen and heard in Vinitsa. We passed Katowice. I gradually shed the weight of memories. My neighbour, an important railway official, tries to make conversation. I learn that he has been transferred to Rostov-on-Don. He doesn't know the city, and he doesn't have the slightest idea about Russia. 
Nevertheless, he signed an agreement that he would serve in Rostov for ten years. Now he wants to find out more. He does not give rest to me and other passengers. To make us more talkative, he pulls out of his suitcase several bottles of alcohol and a whole set of silver liquor glasses. Everyone laughs heartily, helps to open the bottles and thus lighten his luggage a little. He has stocked up for ten years. The liquor does its job and tongues are loose. But the more we tell, the more silent our brave railroader becomes. We have already passed Krakow and Peremyshl, and there is no end to the stories. We educate him too thoroughly and comprehensively about what Russia is. The train arrives in Lvov. There is a frightening confusion at the station. Eels, rooms, waiting rooms. Everything is crowded. Soldiers sit, lie on their belongings and wait. The road to the east is jammed. There's no way to get out of here before two days. I take my suitcase and take a streetcar to the airfield. But even here there is a failure. The weather is not flying. Nevertheless, I stay waiting. Maybe tomorrow there will be an opportunity to fly out with a courier plane. In the evening I go to the city with an Oberleutnant. It makes a good impression on me. Wide streets, beautiful houses, large stores, busy traffic. In a restaurant we meet an officer who tells us about life in the city. He wants to take us to a bar, but we refuse. We're done for the day. Two days later, I finally managed to leave by airplane, which through Kiev took me to Kharkov. Since I could fly to Starobelsk only in the afternoon, I had a few hours to wander around the city. Many soldiers strolling towards me, on the main street. Sumskaya, I stop a dozen soldiers and ask what part they are from. Out of ten, only one from the front part, waiting for a train with vacationers. The rest are from the station and local commandant's office, economic inspection, just, military workshop, requisitioning team, soldiers hotel, repair and restoration platoon, military construction department, field gendarmerie. I refuse from further questioning. Now it is clear why at the front we have such a shortage of men. We lay our heads down there and here in the rear we've created a powerful apparatus. Why should the army be engaged in farming? Why are there so many commandant's offices? At the headquarters of Army Group B in Starobelsk, I learned that my division was transferred to Stalingrad. It operates in the area of the factory Red October. I expected anything but this, exhausted, broken battalions, which need rest. They cannot fix the matter. Adjutant of the General of Engineers explains to me the situation. The division, he assures me, is replenished with men and weapons up to full strength and is now the strongest in this area. And here reigns the same optimism that has disgusted me since my telephone conversation with the general, the commander of my division, and since the night when a whole platoon was killed in a mine explosion. Our division is the strongest. Only a complete ignoramus can say that. I had hoped to find my battalion on my return somewhere warm winter apartments, but it is again on the front line. We landed at the airfield near Golubinskaya. In a populated area two kilometres from here is the headquarters of the 6th Army. I go there, report my arrival, and immediately call the car. I have no desire to meet with acquaintances. I feel impatience and anxiety, because I do not know in what condition I will find my companies. The war and the front again overwhelm me, and I again have a feeling that I will be needed. It's getting dusk when my car arrives to pick me up. Tony Gestatter, the tall, stout driver, is smiling, and the other driver, Baysman, who is smaller and weaker, is smiling too. I have no choice but to smile myself. I am glad to see people from my battalion again. We quickly put the commander's flag on the car and set off, despite Tony's warning. It's night soon. It's better to wait until morning. As we cross the Don and drive on, leaving behind kilometre after kilometre, both drivers tell me the news. I have endless questions. And although I don't get satisfying answers to all of them, I still learn a lot. Casualties have risen. On the streets and in the shops of the Stalingrad factories, the fight is going on with unprecedented fierceness. Here it is impossible to knock weapons out of the hands of the enemy, 
by some method like a Trojan horse. This battle cannot be compared to anything. The old yardsticks don't fit. Tony speaks soberly, with only one thing in his words. I wish this battle would end sooner. Deep in the night, we arrive at the nursery. In this village, only two houses have survived. In one is my battalion clerk, and in the next room, the head of the financial and economic part and the battalion engineer. I am greeted with cheers of joy. But after the first greetings, faces become serious, as if today is a day of commemoration of the dead. Oberfeld Fable Berndt puts a summary of casualties in front of me. Just as a manometer hand indicates pressure, the summary indicates the fierceness of the fighting. A long list of names of dead soldiers, and those who have passed a lot with us, and completely new, unfamiliar. Before the battalion was put into battle, he received a fresh replenishment to the staff. Two hundred men have been killed since then, and the rest I'll have to fight with. To make me happy, Berndt brings a whole stack of letters and parcels that have come to my name in the meantime. But I don't feel like going through them and unwrapping them. Throw everything in the car, I'll take it with me tomorrow. Then I'm going to sit down with the Chief of Finance and the Engineer. Thank God at least everything is in order here. Food, supply of household goods, cars, property. But what good is it if the battalion itself is getting smaller every day? After driving across the steppe past hastily equipped dugouts, past vehicles standing directly under the open sky, past burned railroad cars and downed planes, the next morning I arrived at the battalion command post. It is a camouflaged, as it should be according to the statute, dugout, in which from strength can fit four people. The dugout is located on a high rise from which the first houses of the city on the Volga can be clearly seen. Adjutant Firek greets me. We sit down on a shell crate. Adjutant reports the situation. The division takes positions on the territory of the factory Red October. About half of the shops are already in our hands. Firek tells about the inexorable fierceness of the fighting, about daily losses. They are huge not only in our battalion. I learn about the changes that have taken place in the units, about the plans of the command, I share my impressions about the vacation. I want to tell about pleasant days spent at home, but I keep coming back to what made me sceptical, to Vinitsa and the mood in the rear. I'm telling without embellishments, talking about the fall of confidence in the leadership. Firek and my replacement Fiddler, who had just returned from the front line, listen attentively, shaking their heads with concern. Suddenly Fiddler explodes, Yes, they are all crazy up there. If they think that Stalingrad will fall in a few days, are wrong, and in a great way. Without fresh divisions, nothing can be done here. Your eyes will pop out when you see for yourself. That's what's happening. Having reported to the General about my arrival, I'm going to the area to look at my companies. They're small groups instead. They've been fighting for days without respite. Casualties are heavy. The second company is commanded by Field Feeble Dannenbauer. He reports on the last attempt to advance on the factory territory. It turns out that it is still not entirely in our hands. Lieutenant Moose has all the flamethrowers out of action. The minesmen are no better, only five left. Everywhere you look, the men are gone. The few remaining soldiers are doing the best they can. They shoot, throw hand grenades, get up, run forward and fall down again, lay and remove mines, undermine barriers. Not a day without losses. Thirty go out, twenty-five return, fifteen go out, twelve come back. It is not necessary to be a great mathematician to determine the moment when with the death of the last sapper will end the diary of military operations of our battalion. No, we must do something. I decided to personally report everything to the division headquarters and to make sure that the battalion was taken to training, somewhere where there's no fire. It's unacceptable that completely inexperienced recruits are constantly thrown into battle. But will it make a difference? In fact, I'll only delay the death of my battalion. That's all I can do. After visiting the units, I survey the terrain. 
what to the returning vacationer appears to be a landscape to the experienced eye appears to be a battlefield. Everywhere you look there is scorched earth, mountains of stone, craters, lonely capital walls, and again craters. It's good that they exist. Often enough I had to jump into them to escape the howling evening blessing. Only blind facades are left of the houses, and behind them, again, an immense field of funnels. Slightly visible in the darkness are the skeletons of former buildings. Only the basements can be used. Equipped with additional decks, they give some protection and serve as shelters where headquarters, command posts and reserve groups are located. Everyone and everything is buried in the ground. Trampled paths convergate to the descents into the cellars. Light smoke from short chimneys wafts above them. The days of tents and peasant houses are long gone. In these months, everything has descended a floor below. Who knows how long it will last? I move on and finally get my first glimpse of the entire division site. Yeah, it's not pleasant. The next morning I take my motorcycle and go to the division's CP. There's no general. The head of the operations department. The skin on his hands and face is lemon-coloured. Tiredly, with poorly concealed indifference, welcomes me. He is awaiting the arrival of his replacement so that he can go immediately to the field hospital after the handover. Jaundice is already waiting for new victims. It is a fashionable staff disease. It is both an insidiously creeping ghost and a saving angel. It is both a nightmare and an escape from the nightmare, depending on the perception of the one affected. The yellowness that covers the face is to staffers what heroic death is to officers on the front lines. It pulls men from the ranks. Replacements come from short-term officer courses, and the result is a wrong assessment of the situation, the same wrong orders, which again we have to pay for. I report on what brought me to the division headquarters. Daily losses of experienced sappers require immediate training of specialists. I propose to organise a three-week course in the nursery. The lieutenant colonel makes me laugh. We are not here in a barracks where, despite the situation, can afford such a luxury. No, it's not possible at the moment. You know you need every man on the front lines. You want to save your men at the expense of others. And who will take their place? The regiments are exactly the same as your battalion. There's only a miserable bunch of us left. Here, read the reports on our forces and then judge for yourself. And he hands me a stack of papers. I read. The total strength of all regiments of the division is not even three battalions. The best situation is with the artillery and communications. Yes, it's useless to ask, but the chief of the division still decides to help me. You know, since I'm leaving the division, I don't care. I'll give you some advice. The general has a thing about personal movies. Build him a cosy nest in some former stables so he can watch his favourite Wochenschau in the winter. This will allow you to get a few of your men out of the fire, and the old man just won't get enough of you. You'd better go straight to the rear guard and don't waste any time. But the rear chief of the division, taking advantage of the jaundice, has already gone to a beautiful place far away from the front. I find only his lieutenant, Oberleutnant von Knobloch, it is not difficult for me to inspire him with my plan. I now know what everything looks like in the high command. Vinitsa in miniature, the dream of every decent headquarters. We find a suitable shed right on the spot. The work should begin tomorrow morning, and Nobloch promises to get the general's permission and inform me by telephone. As I say goodbye, I say something in passing. Yes, by the way, the general needs a decent dugout for the winter. Nobody knows how things will go on. I say goodbye and drive my BMW back to my place. From afar, we can already see our high-rise. We christened it Flower Pot. Why, I do not know. Any other name would have been better. But it doesn't matter. I'm glad that the General's movie business worked out. Under this pretext, I can take 20 people. At least, they'll get out of this shit for a while. God willing. Lieutenant Franz is waiting for me in my dugout. He reports his arrival. Immediately I give him an assignment, let him take over the second company, it now has no commander. I inform the Hauptfeld Fable to immediately come for his company. Franz talks about the last days of his vacation. 
his wife didn't want to let him go. On the platform she looked at me as if I was leaving for good, no matter how much I persuaded her, it didn't help. At the last moment I doubted myself. Was it right that I volunteered to go to the front again? But the war won't last long. I'm glad, Mr. Captain, that I'm here again. While they're shooting, my home is among my old comrades. His words are flowing. Wait, 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 my dear. You'll soon sing the wrong song. Stalingrad is not a stroll, not a gallant march like in France, not a sudden invasion of a peaceful country like in 1941. Your Hauptfeldfeeble and the rest of the non-commissioned officers will tell you today what it's like here. Franz says goodbye. The car has already arrived for him. Before I go to sleep, there is a long-awaited call from the division headquarters. The construction of the movie should begin tomorrow at the same time as the construction of the winter dugout for the general. This is even more than I could have expected. I'm dictating orders to Firak. To the first company, which has just enough manpower to do it, so at least one unit will get a rest. Three days later, I'm getting the hang of it. It's like I've never been on vacation. First Company is busy with construction work and spends quiet days in Razgulyevka. The Second Company is fighting a mine war for the whole division. At the railroad embankment crossing our section, it painstakingly retrieves Russian mines laid in the embankment. Ahead, where the front line is becoming less and less dense, large areas of terrain are constantly mined. The mine replaces the man. This is the motto. The Third Company has the hardest time. It gives sappers and other specialists for daily attacking assault groups. Bombers, flamethrowers, miners are required for any operation. Naturally, this company suffers the greatest losses. Reports about them grow on my desk. Clerical fuss bothers me. I move the battalion chancellery from the nursery to the neighbouring dugout. Now, in the nursery remain only the financial and economic part, repair and recovery service and the transport. I have no desire to sit all winter in a cramped hole, in which I now dwell, and therefore I slowly begin to build myself a bigger dugout. There will be room not only for me, but also for an adjutant, a stereo observer and a driver. Fierek is always trying to stay close to me. He won't let me go a step. Sometimes I notice how he stares at me intently from the sidelines. He has something on his mind. I want to let him talk, so I call him to me. We sit across from each other, discuss the situation. It's good that we've given leave to a number of old sappers. At least they will survive, I say. The word leave is uttered. Firek picks it up. It's good for you to talk, you've been on vacation. But for us, sit and wait. Unless a miracle happens and officers fall from the sky, there is nothing to think about going home. We'll stay here without leave until they send us on indefinite leave. Yes, our situation won't improve any time soon. He's right. Why doesn't he go now? We can manage without him for a couple of weeks. Don't look so gloomy, Walter. I promised you a vacation, and you'll get it. I'll give it to you right away, just find a substitute. But wouldn't it be better to go for Christmas? No, I'd rather have a bird in the hand. Who can say what'll happen in two months? And there'll be a metre of snow in December. I've got a silly feeling about this. Who's going to replace you? Berger, I think. He's been sunbathing in the engineer supply platoon for a long time. You got the leave certificate form? Yes. Give it to me. I fill in the form, sign at the bottom. Well, go with God. The car will take you to cheer station. Have Berger come back with it? Is that clear? Walter can't believe how happy he is. He rushes to the machine and calls Fiedler. We should celebrate. I've got a bottle of Burgundy. We'll drink it tonight, the three of us. I'm damn happy for my wife. Can you imagine the look in her eyes when I show up? He's just overjoyed. The joy of at least a few weeks to escape from the war. The desire to see his wife and daughter as soon as possible make him immediately start packing. Everything happens lightning fast. 